black holes. Roger Penrose in the UK, there's a black hole up there, has suggested that, you know, maybe they hang out around black holes, or he didn't really suggest that, but maybe we should, our descendants should hang out around black holes because you can get a lot of energy out of a black hole. What you can essentially do is by throwing your garbage around the black hole and that kind of thing, you can extract the angular momentum energy of the black hole. You need a spinning black hole. Okay. And by the way, the, the angular momentum of the sun, I work it out, is like 10 to the 36 joules. That's a lot of energy. So, you know, if you have a black hole that's made from a star about the size of the sun, 10 to the 36 joules will keep a society like ours going until the last star has burned out. Right? A long, long time. So, you know, maybe they've gone there. Um, I, I like these guys, these so-called Bach globules, because Bart Bach, famous uh, Dutch astronomer, actually uh, found these guys. These are just dark patches of dust and gas. They, they're typically the nice size. They're just covered with a radio telescope, too. And sometimes there's some bright stars nearby. But the real point is that these things are, are really cold. A lot of molecules there. 20 to 100 solar masses, a lot of material, very cold. Very cold might be interesting if you're a machine because those of you who have taken thermodynamics know that a machine is much more efficient if it's got a good heat sink, if it's in a really cold environment. You want the temperature difference between the engine and the, and the environment to be great. So these very, very cold places, which are only a couple of degrees above absolute zero, might be the places where some really clever machines are hunkered down. Well, then let me finish off here. It's been 50 years since Frank Drake, who comes into the Institute every morning and writes this equation on the board. A little unclear what it means. I keep meaning to ask Frank. Anyhow, 50 years. We haven't found a signal yet. And that may sound like a long time, but again, the total number of star systems that we've looked at carefully up until now is 750. So even if you think that's the best scheme, that's such a paltry sample, right? Such a small sample. I mean, to say paltry is to denigrate it. It's actually a lot of work by a lot of people. It was an incredible uh, tour de force to do that experiment. But it's still a very small sample of the star systems in the galaxy. Okay? We've just begun to fight, as it were. Thanks to new instruments like the Allen Telescope Array, we'll be able to speed up the search. And uh, I've already suggested to you that if our assumptions about how many societies are out there are anywhere near correct, we may trip across the signal in the next two dozen years. So it's it's the wrong strategy to give up. This is not the time to give up. This is the time, in fact, to get optimistic about the possibility of the future. I just show you this last plot, just in case anybody still has their eyeballs open. These, these dots show you the, uh, the speed, some metric of the speed of SETI searches since 1960. There's Frank's original experiment there. You see the red line is Moore's Law, and you see the speed follows Moore's Law very carefully. And with this slide here, this is a picture I made in June of 1997, and this is the basement of the SETI Institute when we were in our old quarters. This, this picture was made at 3.30 in the morning. You see Tom Pearson, our CEO there. Kent Cullors, the blind physicist in the movie Contact. was working there at that time. And we had found a signal that for a long time, 16 hours, looked like it had the characteristics that we were looking for. Very interesting. This really is 3.30 in the morning. I was so nervous, I couldn't sit down. I just had to walk around taking pictures because it gave me something to do. Right? Nobody went home. Nobody went to In-N-Out Burger. Well, there wasn't any In-N-Out Burger in Mountain View then. Uh, Nobody got, you know, food. We just sat there and watched this signal. Well, that turned out to be a false alarm. That was the SOHO satellite, and uh, it was uh, largely due to an instrumentation problem that we had that we even thought it was real, but it was an extraordinarily good test run to show what happens when you get a real signal. What, what happens when you get a real signal is you stay up all night, and by morning, the media are calling you. The New York Times called me in the morning. They already knew about it. Hours into this, they already knew about it. You needn't worry that all this will be kept from you. It won't. They'll, they'll be writing stories about it long before we've confirmed the signal. That's for sure. That's, you'll read about it first in the checkout line. That's my usual. And, and yes, you will. This hasn't happened yet. But I think it, it, it is likely to happen in this next generation. I bet everybody a cup of coffee on that. And I think that the other thing we might do is, although we've been doing Frank's experiment now for 50 years, there are other approaches that I hope I've... Uh, thrown at you, some of which I think may appeal to some of you that I think we ought to try. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, yeah, my question is, so a, a couple of things you pointed out in the talk were essentially uh, looking at waste products, you know. Uh, I love Lucy Broadcast's um, oxygen, which is really a waste product for plants. Um, as you look at uh, ideas about uh, more advanced civilizations, this computronium idea, that kind of thing, 
Has anyone ever given any thought to what kinds of uh, waste products a civilization like that might produce and what you might look for to just see if they're leaving a ta trail of trash behind them? Right. Did everybody hear the question? I'm not going to repeat it because there's a PA system here. Uh, I'm sure Desi Arnaz would thank you precious little for <laughs> calling his long-running program a waste product. But... Uh, but you're right. I mean, in, in a sense, you're looking for the, 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 the residue. And, and oxygen, by the way, is actually useful for us, if not so much for the plants. But somebody has, to answer your question, somebody has done that. There was, an, there was a presentation I heard a couple of years ago, and unfortunately, I can't remember the guy's name. He was an economist. And what he did is he said, imagine there's a really advanced society, and they're, you know, they're, they're kind of aggressive, and they just sort of sweep through big sectors of the galaxy. And what are they going to leave behind? They're going to leave, you know, if you, if you, you look behind Alexander's army, you know, walk around Europe and the Middle East and into India, and there, there's all this junk left behind, right? The, the, the remains of the encampments and the food and all that stuff, dead bodies, whatever. And so he tried to figure out, indeed, the answer to your question, what would be left behind. Unfortunately, I don't remember the answer to your question. But, it was, but there was, uh, you know, among the things to look for were strange uh, radioactive isotopes, because presumably they would have, of course, some form of nuclear power and some of the obvious reactions were considered. And they, they all produced these isotopes that you wouldn't find in nature, right, in the abundances that you might find in the trail of some uh, colonizing force. So uh, that, that, that article actually is probably published somewhere. Send me an email and maybe I can find it. But indeed, at least one person has looked at it. I think it's a good idea, although it's kind of disconcerting to think that we're looking directly for the trash. Over here, let's try this again. Uh, Seth, you mentioned uh, the movies, and indeed it is a great pleasure and honor uh, to know you personally, and because of that I know that you like to watch really bad science fiction movies. Uh, do you, uh, did you even bother to watch the recent wonderful science fiction movie that everyone was is talking about, and what did you think? Thank you. Uh, which, which one was that? I'm sorry. I got, uh, I got everything but the title. Avatar. Avatar. Oh. I, it's like a setup, Mark. Because I, I wrote a review of it. <laughs> I wrote a review of it. Yeah, you can read it. It's actually on the Huffington Post. But you, to find it on the Huffington Post is, a, is actually not so easy. The best thing to do is go to the SETI Institute website at www.seti.org. Right? Go there, and uh, you'll find a link to it. And, uh, you know, I talk about it. I mean, I, look, there's so many things you could say about Avatar, and it just seems like a cheap shot to say most of them. You know, but they live in a tree. <laughs> okay. I, by the way, I had dinner with, the, with, with Cameron once here in Los Altos. <laughs> I committed a faux pas, and he nearly stabbed me with his fork. But, but I, you know, I actually like the film a great deal, but the, the, most of the article describes the feasibility, and this was the premise of the film, not giving anything away here, really. It, it involves a mining operation on a distant planet. Right, we go to a distant planet, Earthlings. We go to a distant planet to bring back unobtainium, which I thought was a singularly unimaginative but daring name for this stuff unobtainium that was worth $20 million a kilogram. And all I did in the article is work out how much it costs to bring that back. <laughs> and uh, the bottom line of the article says, this is like ordering a book from Amazon, latest bestseller, and having to pay $60,000 for the postage. <laughs> you probably wouldn't do it. And yet, and the reason I picked on this is because this is a very familiar trope in science fiction that uh, will go mine somebody else's worlds. I, I don't think that makes a whole lot of sense myself. Um, but the, the film is good, by the way. I commend the film to you, in my opinion. Okay, uh, back over here. Are there any plans to do uh, very long-term searches of individual stars lasting months, perhaps years? And if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I, I didn't catch all of it. It was the idea to change the targeted searches instead of looking for a few minutes to look for a few years. Instead of a few minutes, stare at a star or a star system for a few Stare years. at the same star for a few years. It might be a flicker once in a while or something. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it's certainly been advocated. You know, God, we're only spending a couple of minutes at any given frequency on any given star. That doesn't sound like much. Maybe we ought to spend longer. Well, maybe we ought to spend longer, particularly if they're pinging us, you know, that kind of thing. But here's the trade-off. If you're looking at individual stars one at a time, looking for these long-lived signals, is it a better strategy to spend that time staring at this one star, or is it a better strategy to say, look, that star had its chance of going to other stars? Right? Maybe only one. I mean, if you think Frank is right about 10,000 societies in the galaxy that are clever enough to, to want to get in touch with you, then one in, roughly one in a few million stars will have such a society. So how long should you spend on any one of them? 